Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on Learn How Students Can Run Any Software on Any Device from Any Location with AppStream 2.0. I'm Michelle Cardinal, your MC for the webinar, and I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Joe Wakeman, Director of Technology at Nevada Community School District. He has several years of experience in education technology management with current experience in major technology platforms and educational practices. Darren Cook, CEO of Synchronet. He has a, been a business leader in telecommunications, managed services, cloud, and data center industries for more than 25 years. His experience ranges from sales leadership, executive leadership with PL ownership to CEO and board member roles. And Anna Hansen, sales director at ByteSpeed. Anna calls the ByteSpeed home office her home away from home. She has been the director of sales for the last four years after having been one of the Byte Speed's leading salespeople for the previous 11 years. And I would like to turn it over to our presenters. Welcome. Thank you so much, Michelle. I really appreciate that. And um, appreciate all of you guys taking time out of this crazy, crazy and learn a little bit about a pilot program that we're, that we're offering leveraging Amazon AppStream 2.0. So with that in mind, I'm going to hand over the floor to Darren Cook. Thanks again, Michelle. Thanks, Anna. It's uh... Uh, Darren Cook here. So I wanted to walk through a little bit about how AppStream works without getting too far into the weeds. Um, AppStream is a product developed by uh, Amazon Web Services and has been uh, in market for a few years and really designed to help uh, enable remote work. So there's obviously an opportunity in the K-12 space to take the requirements that generally are facilitated by a physical lab inside of the school and create an environment where that can be consumed uh, remotely. So we were actually working through deploying and working with many school districts even before COVID, um, you know, to uh, replace or augment physical uh, computer labs. And obviously, as you can imagine, that conversation has accelerated, as has the, uh, the deployment of this technology to basically allow uh, kids access to their curriculum, um, whether in a hybrid environment and they are uh, doing their homework or some uh, course material outside of the class uh, or um, in uh, an environment where they're 100% they're remote. So they can use this technology in association with a physical computer lab, do some stuff in the lab, some stuff remotely, or they can use this solution 100%. Obviously in today's environment where things are changing on literally an hour by hour basis, um, having a plan that adds some flexibility and agility is, uh, is really, uh, paying dividends for some of our uh, schools. So how does AppStream work? So AppStream will, uh, is a service provided by Amazon that has instances or VMs, if you will, that are running inside of AWS. Those instances are running an image with certain applications. So it is a dedicated machine to each student when they log in and they request, um, so let's say they're taking a project lead the way pathway, let's say intro to engineering. When they log into that environment, it'll have the applications there that they need to facilitate that curriculum. Um, they will launch that application. That application will run on a instance inside of AWS. And then when they're done, it'll turn it down. So it's a, it's a pay per use model um, and would really facilitate just about any Windows application. So obviously we have uh, districts that are running this for their uh, engineering and design curriculum, uh, more advanced classes that may require uh, SolidWorks or MATLAB, uh, some of the, the advanced AP classes. And then quite honestly, we've also had districts running normal business applications on this as well. 
food distribution applications, things like that, that people would need to add, access remotely in today's world uh, versus being on premises uh, in the past. So it's a very secure way that you can leverage these environments regardless of device. So many of the schools that we're talking with obviously are a one-to-one -one school with, uh, with Chromebooks. And so running this, uh, this service inside of a browser, it'll have a look and feel just like a Windows uh, desktop. So to, to that point, um, Anna, did we want to go ahead? And I know we had a couple of uh, questions. Uh, did we want to insert and, and do a quick poll to, to see what folks are thinking about as it comes to a remote computer lab? Yeah, I think that'd be great. Let's put the poll up. And then I was just going to say, I encourage you guys to ask questions and we'll um, answer them as we go through. So um, we'd love for this to be as interactive as possible. Uh, please feel free to just um, answer questions in the chat window and we'll we'll answer them as we go through the presentation. So, um, Michelle, do you want to walk folks through um, answering these uh, these questions and, and what that will look like from a poll perspective? Sure, we've got some um, answers being recorded right now. Almost the full number of attendees have voted. And there are a few questions in the Q&A, um, if you wanted to look at those while folks are answering the poll. We'll leave the polling open for just a few more seconds. Yeah, so a couple of questions that are coming in, we can we can start. Um, so relative to licensing, uh, we're actually working with PLTW uh, on, on licensing. So you can set up a licensing server um, and uh, to be able to address your um, um, project lead -way pathway requirements for those applications. Um, AppStream does work with uh, with videos, so there uh, you can uh, leverage YouTube or, or other video instances. The only caveat I would add there is you uh, would want to balance out the experience of the video. So if you're doing video editing, those kinds of things, you would probably want to do queuing associated with that. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's that's absolutely a capability. Auto editing software specifically, one of the questions was uh, Mixcraft for uh, music projects. I haven't worked on uh, a deployment. Um, there haven't been quite honestly very many um, Windows applications that haven't functioned. It's the, the balance of uh, real time as uh, you're leveraging a protocol so the way that I think about AppStream is that the environment in the system is running inside of AWS. And you're using the protocol, it's called NICE DCV, uh, which is a protocol that, uh, that uh, uh, Amazon actually purchased. And so you're, you're really transmitting the uh, visualization of what's occurring. In some cases, there can be a lag. Um, but we've noticed that it's in very rare circumstances. So it's very difficult to say no problem, anything all the time. But what I would say is that the 95% um, of the applications that we've run have been successful. So, so Scott was asking a question. They're not a P, uh, PLTW school, but they do have uh, Autodesk. 
So part of the licensing uh, strategy we would have is we would actually, with this product, we'd be putting a licensing server inside of AWS. So it would run like a VM, um, and it's fully managed by uh, the Bytespeed team. And um, so you would just ensure that your licensing is um, uh, enabled in AWS, and we could walk you through how that's going to work. But essentially, those instances in AWS are going to go to that licensing server in AWS to be able to receive the licensing uh, that they need. Absolutely, Adobe Photoshop will run on this. Um, and um, um, AD authentication um, popped up as a question from, from Ron. So um, uh, as this uh, ByteSpeed product is shaped up today, we're only using uh, a Google authentication um, uh, because it's the lowest common denominator. You can indeed leverage other user authentication mechanisms for um, uh, for the environment, it adds a little bit of complexity. So we would need to do a custom environment. Um, and so that would be outside of this pilot program. But I would uh, encourage Anna and her team to, to follow up or for you to, to send a note that you're interested if, uh, if AD is your uh, primary authentication mechanism. Another question from Allison saying that asking if AppStream applications will interact with one another, they will. So when you're thinking about this image that you've built all of these applications, think of it as a single system. So think about it where you have a, an instance that's running with um, AutoCAD and Venture or, or whatever helper applications you have, viewers or those kinds of things, uh, recorders, whatnot. Uh, those can all interact together. So it's not a presentation of a single uh, application. It's a presentation of an image that has a collection of applications together. You'll be able to get a picture of that um, in just a moment because I'm going to hand it off to Joe. I think we've been able to get through most of the questions. So let's look at the poll. Do you feel like you need a um, remote computer lab solution for fall semester? So we all know fall's right around the corner. Um, so it looks like uh, most of the folks absolutely need something. Uh, very few saying no, some saying maybe. I would probably answer that as maybe because who, who knows what uh, is lurking around the corner from a prerequisite. One of the things that I did want to call out is uh, associated with this program specifically in the way that the Bytespeed team has architected this is that it's really designed to be easy for you to purchase and deploy. Knowing that there's a ton of competing priorities on everybody's calendar today in your environment, needing to know how to get access this to, uh, to classrooms or what's going to be remote and just there's so many things undetermined. This can be something very easy to enable a remote computer lab for honestly very, very low dollars that's completely managed so the IT team can continue to work on the things that, that, that they need to. The curriculum team can continue to work on what they need and then allow ByteSpeed to build this environment that's fully managed at a relatively low cost. Um, so with that, I think we can uh, close out that poll. And um, Joe, I think you're up to do, a, to do a demo. Awesome, thanks, Darren. So what I'm gonna show you today is uh, our implementation at our district of AppStream. Um, kind of like we mentioned before, we're doing um, several project lead the way applications, including Autodesk Inventor. We also use it for graphics design courses. So we're doing uh, Adobe Photoshop Illustrator and that sort of thing inside of AppStream. Uh, but what I'm gonna do is share my screen here. So um, we also leverage Google authentication. Um, you can leverage an existing SSO with AppStream. So we leverage our existing Google environment. So when students sign in, it'll automatically pass their credentials through their Chromebook or browser or whatever they're doing right to AppStream. So then I'll get uh, this app catalog, which has applications that are available to my users. 
Um, and in this case, we're gonna test Autodesk Inventor. So I've got that loaded here in another tab. So Inventor is here, it's running in the browser. Now, uh, this experience is exactly the same regardless of what platform you're running it on. So if I'm running it on a PC, a Mac, a Chromebook, whatever, um, the experience is gonna be the, the exact same experience that the kids would see. So uh, now a caveat is my Inventor skills aren't great. Um, you will see how limited uh, the ability to what I'm able to do is pretty quickly. Um, but really, we just want to show that the software works in a browser um, on any device. So I'm going to create a new project here with Inventor. Let it create all of its stuff in the background. There we go. Let's start a 2D sketch. Pick the plane that I want to draw on. Draw my rectangle here. Let's make our rectangle 3D. Put a hole in our rectangle. So there we are. So you can see that I'm able to uh, run this pretty hefty Windows application uh, right here in the browser on, on my device, uh, on a device that I'm running it on a Mac. So it's a device that wasn't even meant to uh, run this application in the first place, but I'm able to run it and, and do everything I need to. Another cool thing with the Google integration is um, I can leverage our already existing Google Drive infrastructure to, for file storage. So if I wanted to save my drawing here, my awesome drawing, just like you would be saving to a flash drive or any other network connected drive, under this PC, I have my Google Drive and I would have uh, any kind of shared folders or shared drop drives that I may have access to as well, I would have access to. So say your, your teacher has a drop folder that they want projects saved in, you could do that, or you could have a directory that's saved amongst kids that are doing group projects. But I can save right here to my to my Google Drive. And now the file is accessible from Drive, whether it's here through AppStream or another device that's connected with Drive. Um, but that's another really cool thing uh, with AppStream as well that you're not going to see on other platforms is that, that slick integration. Um, and that's really kind of the extent of what I've got to show you, um, just that the software works and it works on any device. Sounds great. I guess if we'll go back over to the, the presentation. You guys should be, do you, are you guys seeing the slide right now? We do. Perfect. Joe, do you want to talk a little bit about, um, and, and then I'll jump in and share the, the pilot application uh, information too, but um, do you want to talk a little bit about what we're trying to accomplish um, with, with the pilot program? And I'll move that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So a um, few things that we want to accomplish with the, with the pilot program is um, you want to be able to identify um, applications that that you needed a on-site lab to work with. So um, especially given the situation that we don't know that we're going to be in in this fall, um, our kids going to be able to to come to school if they are, um, is a physical computer lab going to be distance enough to be safe? Um, so with, with AppStream, you're able to accomplish um, pretty much anything you can think of. You're, you're delivering an application to a web browser. So it can be accessible at home. It can be accessible in a traditional classroom without having to go to the lab. Um, you can spread out as far as you need. So that's that's really one big thing that just kind of looking to this fall, um, what we can what we can solve um, with the purchasing process, especially um, AppStream's billing can be kind of cumbersome. So one thing that that uh, Byte Speed is doing is that you can you can purchase blocks of hours. So that way, rather than having a 
kind of an unknown cost per month, depending on usage and that sort of thing, you'll, you'll have a little bit better uh, budgetary controls. Um, also building out a dashboard so that you can, you can get a really good idea as to your usage and uh, billing so that you've got, you as a, as a system administrator can understand what your usage statistics look like, where your money's kind of going there. Um, and, and really kind of take, take the collective experience of all these schools and, and offer, offer up something that, that's available whenever and wherever um, and, and seamless to students. One of the, I wanted to take a second if we can. Um, we're cooking along pretty good on time. So I wanted to answer uh, live a couple of the questions that are coming in about the, the Google Drive uh, integration. Uh, the Google Drive integration is a feature of, of AppStream, so it, uh, it allows the, uh, the students to have um, access there based upon their uh, uh, user credentials and then uh, be able to save work. So once they save it, obviously, to their Google Drive, they'll be able to access it from, from anywhere. So if they're working on a project, um, Alice and ask, you know, they've got MySQL projects. They would just save that raw file there inside of their uh, the Google Drive. And then if, let's say they, they are able to go into school and they want to use the physical computer labs, then they could log in, access their Google Drive, and those files would be there. And then obviously opening those files requires the application to be um, on that particular system but uh, all the files would, uh, would be there. Some of the considerations in thinking about, and obviously we've seen some of these questions come up is, you know, relative to licensing. Again, you'll have a licensing server that will be provided for you inside of the byte speed environment. The ByteSpeed team um, in uh, partnership with Synchronet uh, will be managing that environment for you. So essentially, we just need a list of applications that you would like to, to enable for uh, your students. There'll be a, a pre-qualified list, but quite honestly, most of the applications we've been talking about today are already on that list. If there's not, if, that, if you have an application that's not yet identified and on the list, then we would just need to test that application, ensure that we understand the uh, considerations of managing that uh, on an image, and then we could add that to the list. So obviously that doesn't preclude um, the uh, application from being considered. We just need to uh, apply a little bit of extra um, effort to ensure that it fits within our calculations. So calculating hours, uh, and I don't know, Anna, if you wanted to, to uh, provide a, a link to the calculator, there's a, a simple calculator that we've created to help uh, districts understand uh, how many hours that, uh, that they would need. The uh, byte speed solution, again, is, is based on um, uh, buckets of hours. And the reason we are doing that is because it's the buying mechanisms, obviously, for K through 12, you know, opens up, um, you know, prior to fall and projects the rest of the year. And so we wanted to make sure that you could go ahead and, and purchase this, uh, these buckets of hours for you to consume uh, over a uh, uh, period of time. So, um, uh, and I don't know if you wanted to, to show that or not. I'm, I'm sorry, I, you know, I go figure right now of all the times I've, I have not had wireless issues or connectivity issues at all, but right now I am. So <laughs> I, it's I, nothing I, like a, a live webinar to, to bring those, to bring those out. So, yeah. So yeah, give me a minute. I'm trying to get her to pull up. So no I, problem. We had a question come in. So I'll just divert over to the question. So Steve asks about, is it a Win 10 uh, VM and can users have a personalized desktop based on their login? So this environment is non-persistent, meaning that each time somebody logs in, that it's going to be a, a new environment. So it's not a custom environment. 
if you needed something like that, there are services available from Amazon Web Services that would give you a persistent environment. But generally what we found is for schools in particular needing the remote computer lab, that a non-persistent environment is better because it's less overhead. And then the, the other thing there is, is if you do want that persistent where they can log in and it's custom and it's them for all uh, uh, for them to use, no problem, you can do that. Uh, it's not part of this program, but we could work with uh, Bytespeed to, uh, uh, to help understand the options. That other service is called Amazon Workspaces, which is a persistent DAS solution, desktop as a service. And, um, um, you know, we've helped, you know, deploy tens of thousands of those. So that's uh, available as well. So hopefully that answers your yeah. question. Darren, I think that's a that's an important uh, distinction is that AppStream is is strictly delivering the application of the desktop. So um, the kids aren't going to have you know they're not going to have the start menu. They're not going to have uh, a desktop that they can configure and set shortcuts and things on. Uh, it's truly just an application in the browser. Um, there there is a little bit of application persistence um, as far as like if I. Photoshop, if I set some custom brushes and set my workspace up um, a certain way, I can save those, those preferences or save to kind of my local profile um, as far as those. So next time I would log in, wherever it may be, some of those settings will come back. Uh, but it, it's, it's purely a, a desktop, or not a desktop, but an application. Um, and that was kind of an important thing that when we went down this road was I didn't want to deliver kids another another desktop environment that they needed to manage. I wanted them to seem like they were running Photoshop in their, on their Chromebook or they were running Inventor on their Chromebook. Uh, and, and AppStream really delivers on that, that the kids don't even know they're running this somewhere else. It's just, to them, it seems like the application is running natively on their machine. Are you guys, are you guys seeing the web page? We are. Yay, yes. okay. Technical difficulties temporarily, hopefully, diverted here. So I just, as, as the guys were just discussing, we've got this application set up. So you're going to go to bytespeed.com forward slash app stream. If you click here for hours calculator, I'll open this up so you can kind of discuss what they're looking at here, Darren. Hopefully the calculator will show. Let me know if you guys can see the calculator pulling up here. I don't. Oh, do you see it now? No. <laughs> Better now or now? Better now or now? One or two? It will, we will get through this. There we go. We see it. All right. Do you guys see it? We do. All right. So do you want to talk through what, what each of the, what they're, what we're calculating and how we're using this to get to the number of hours? You bet. Right. Very simple calculation. How many students do you have enrolled that would need to access a remote computer lab? The next line is how many uh, class hours per week um, would they need access to that? And then what we're trying to do here with the um, total lab computers is try to think about how many students would be logged on at one time. So you can really relate back to how many um, physical computer labs that you have because generally what we've seen is uh, people um, architect their classes around the physical computer labs and the number of um, uh, computers available inside of that lab. And then lastly, the number of uh, homework hours per student per week. Do you, and it could be zero, um, or it could be 10, you know, hours per week. This is generally a new component for uh, the curriculum because these environments traditionally haven't been available remotely. So uh, I would definitely just think through uh, what, you know, how many hours that you want to, to make available. Generally, an hour or two is sufficient. And then you, you'll calculate the number of um, 
hours um, total that you'll need. So in this example, the um, the annual hours package right is is nine thousand. So uh, at that point, you would need to I think if you scroll down, it'll tell you how many packages you need. Each package has twenty five hundred hours and is for uh, five thousand. So in this example. Um, you can support your your school for twenty thousand dollars for the for the the school year, um, and that would give you ten thousand hours available for instruction and homework. Talking to myself, I'll click out of uh, that calculator here and just kind of really quickly um, share the, this page with you guys. It, there's your explanation here and it talks about um, it talks about the hours calculator here and then the time frame. So what we're trying to do is stagger people in just so that we can make sure that we're enrolling and getting good feedback. Your guys' feedback in this pilot program is is really critical. Um, rather than launch to this just full blown, we decided to do this as a pilot and stagger people in so that we could really work with the schools that we're enabling in the pilot program to get feedback and make sure that the solution that we're developing and what we're, what we're offering is what people need. So we're really excited about it. Um, once you fill out this application, an email will come over to myself and our CTO, Lucas Holney. We'll schedule a call, go through details with you, make sure that you guys are a good fit. Um, we started with Adobe, Autodesk, and Project Lead the Way for the applications that we're launching. Uh, like Darren said, if there's anything on this list that you'd like to talk about, just let us know. Um, we'd like to continue to grow and make more options available. We just wanted to make sure that we had everything working perfectly before we, before we did that. Um, are there any questions in the in the portal or anything that we can answer? I've been clearing them out, so there's a lot of good answered questions, uh, some really great questions in there that uh, I've been responding to. So. Awesome. Awesome. So yeah, that's that's really that's really it. Um, if you're interested in in joining the the pilot, we would absolutely love to have you. And. Um, if you just go to bitespeed.com forward slash app stream, you can fill out the application here. If you'd prefer to just set up a call with us and discuss what you're, what you're looking to do, we'd be happy to jump in and, and do that. But is there anything else that uh, you would want to share there, Darren or Joe? Uh, we have a couple of other questions we can answer live. Um, um, I'm a better talker than typer, so. Uh, <laughs> so what happens when a student never logs out? Uh, you'll set session thresholds. Um, you know, you can set them for an hour or two hours, uh, and and uh, that would uh, based upon the prerequisites. So uh, to kick them out of the session so they don't sit there and, and consume uh, all of your uh, your stuff. So a uh, question came in about licensing. Um, so we will have a licensing server inside of the environment that Bytespeed uh, and Synchronet will build for you inside of Amazon. And then the uh, instances, AKA remote, you know, remote uh, virtual machines in Amazon with access licensing uh, from, uh, from within that environment. Yeah, so Steve, hopefully that, that answers. So both your Adobe and your AutoCAD licenses would uh, would live inside of uh, uh, AWS. So question, this is a good question. Does the, the, the $5,000 include all the cost of running AWS instances and any extra costs um, getting the licensing from Adobe or wherever to get them? So. It does absolutely include all of the AWS costs. Um, any cost of licensing is still the responsibility of the district. So we're just running the applications that you have already procured. So a great, great question. Um, so once you have the licensing, whether they're granted through, through uh, an EDU or that you've purchased them, um, we can make them available inside of the AWS environment. 
Uh, Steve, just saw your, your note there. Um, Anna, if you can uh, get with uh, uh, Steve, he's uh, looks like he needs some, some quick help. Absolutely. I was just trying to think of other questions that had come up uh, in the conversations we've had so far. One of them was around bandwidth and how important is bandwidth to having this run successfully. Um, do you wanna do you wanna jump on that one at all, Darren? Sure, sure. Um, so so bandwidth, you can leverage the solution over a uh, um, you know cell phone Wi-Fi if uh, if needed Wi-Fi uh, or general public. Um, Wi-Fi if, if a student doesn't have something at home. It doesn't consume a ton of, uh, of bandwidth. So, um, you know, a, a, a two meg connection um, will facilitate an okay experience. It's not going to be as good as if it's on 10 meg, um, but it would facilitate the curriculum consumption. Another question that came in is about SolidWorks. Absolutely, SolidWorks is uh, available on uh, on AppStream. So. so there's a question about the limitation of storage on the installed applications. So Adobe Creative Suite, Revit, SolidWorks, um, uh, I'm assuming there, Al, that you're talking about the files themselves. So the files are going to be stored on, uh, you have two options to store files. Um, that is um, either on uh, OneDrive or Google Drive. So the, the actual uh, storage there of those files are going to be um, um, on one of those platforms. It does include the installation of the app itself on that image. So you would you could build the image and those applications would be there. As Joe mentioned before, there are a couple of things that do persist uh, for the users as far as uh, simple settings and those kinds of things. And those are stored in S3 in AWS are, and are included in the service. So I think that's most of the questions that we've been able to, to get. So um, Anna, did you want to just uh, iterate one, one more time how to uh, um, get going on uh, the pilot application? Let's see if there's yeah, any I'll questions. Definitely. I just would share one more time. If you're interested on the application, just go to bitespeed.com forward slash app stream. Um, we will be following up with everybody right away. We won't leave you hanging. Um, we'll set up a call and go through your situation and make sure that you're a good fit and then we'll get you onboarded. It should move pretty quickly. It looks like we've got one more question that just jumped into the chat, Darren. Uh, yeah, so it looks like the scheduled hours per week seems to be a big player in requiring more packages to purchase. So what this is, what this is calculating um, is basically how many hours. So in a single package, you have 2,500 hours available to you. Um, if you have, um, uh, I'm going to create a really wild scenario. So let's say that you have a curriculum that is five hours, um, you know, uh, a day. <laughs> That's, you know, and you have 20 students. As you can see, that, that would really rack up over a period of time. Generally, what, what you're seeing and what you want to think about when using that calculator is um, how many students you have, how, how many classes are they enrolled. So if, if you have 100 students that enrolled in Intro to Engineering and that uh, Intro to Engineering has one hour um, per um, weekday, right, then you have five hours uh, per week. So just think about it from, from that perspective. Um, hopefully, hopefully that helps. So uh, is Microsoft Suite available? So again, this, this solution would run any Windows. Um, you would obviously want to ensure from a licensing perspective that any application that you want to run is, is enabled. Um, and uh, would would work from a licensing perspective, but technically it would work. So, 
Darren, I don't, we don't have the Microsoft Office suite filled in for the pilot program right now. Do you have any idea when or if we would be adding that into the pilot? Um, we would probably need to, to gauge the, uh, the need for that and probably have to take it on a, a one-off basis, I would imagine. That sounds good. It looks like there's a lot of questions regarding that. So it might be a bigger conversation for us later. Thank you guys for sharing that. Yeah. Um, is there a limit to the number or size of apps you can have available? So there's a, uh, for this product specifically, there's a list of applications already pre-approved. Most of them would be inside of your normal design and engineering classes, but please let us know what apps you need and then we can validate those and add those to the approved list. Um, and um, Anna, there was a, a question from Steve on, uh, is there a time window to join up? No, absolutely not. Uh, the pilot will keep moving and adding people in, in waves. And so that's why we have the, when do you expect that you'll be going in? But hopefully we'll move from the pilot phase here in the next several months and be going where we're not leaning on you guys so heavily for feedback. The value with the, with the pilot right now is that you get, you don't have to pay any setup. You, there's no anything for you. And you get to, for all intents and purposes, be a part of the development. We'll be leaning on you guys, asking questions and advice, and um, it'll be a little tighter working relationship than when we feel like we've got the solution where we want it to be. So I, definitely not a time limit though. Yeah, there's a, there's a good question that came in I want to address. Um, so um, the question is, so the word pilot scares me is we cannot have a solution that, that will not work 100% of the time. Is there a concern there at all? zero concern about the, um, the solution and, the, and, and the, um, delivering this. So a little bit of background. So Synchronet, uh, so we are a specific AWS partner that focuses in on uh, these solutions for both for education, public sector, and uh, commercial customers. So we've deployed um, over 100,000 people into these kinds of environments. Um, and and uh, it works very well. The pilot aspect of this is where we are packaging it differently. So this is more of a product from Bytespeed package versus a technology pilot, if you will. So we wanna make sure that everything that we've put together from the way that we you guys are con consume this as far as the application types, um, the way that we're interfacing with you is, is good. So it's more of a process and product validation than it is a technical validation. Great question. Um, let's see. So if I, uh, one of the examples was if I have a, a one lab of 30 computers, I have about 20 students. Uh, they're given any time for, for four hours a day for four different classes. Uh, that means five days a week. So is that 80 scheduled hours and 80 students? Uh, this seems like one of those questions you would get on a, on a, a, a SAT, you know, you have a train that's that's coming from the west at X number of miles an hour. Um, let's see. So let's use this example real quick. We have just a few minutes. Uh, Anna, can you bring up the um, the calculator and let's let's use uh, Scott's example and kind of roll through. Absolutely. I thought another thing that might be useful for people too is um, if Joe Joe's actually run this through his different classes, you could talk about what his usage looks like. Obviously, things are a little bit unique as we move through the pandemic. We don't know what classes are going to look like and what access is going to look like. So um, just bear with me while I pull this up here. You guys should be seeing the screen now. Yep. Okay. So we'll have to back into this a little bit, uh, Scott, so bear, bear with me. Um, 20 students for four different classes. Um, 
so that is, um, let's say, 80 students. Okay, so that's total scheduled class hours per week is actually four hours a day, so that's 20. Total uh, computers are 30. So really the question, uh, Scott, that you would have here is how much homework? Let's just say we're gonna give them uh, an hour and so if you scroll down, and uh, so basically at this point, you would need, um, you know, 10 packages for a total of 25,000 hours. So hopefully that, hopefully that helps, Scott. And we can dial it in as well. The other thing you can do here, so this calculator is kind of a, it's gonna be a worst case scenario. If you want to start with one package to get the environment built and understand the consumption, because I don't know, Scott, if you're, you know, the big variable here too is, are you gonna be 100% remote throughout the entire year? Personally, I would probably go a little conservative and I would maybe even cut that in half um, to ensure that um, I'm using the environment in a, a hybrid scenario. So you, you, that is a, I think that is a worst case if you had to do this 100% uh, remote and those uh, uh, students were using this environment 100% of the time um, when they were in their classes. I just uh, really quick would just say um, we had another poll question. I think it'd be kind of helpful for people because I know that that's something that everybody's trying to figure out. I don't know if we could throw that last poll question up there. I almost forgot about it, honestly. And then in the conversations that I've been having with people, it seems like a lot of people are just buying a smaller package of hours than they need. There's so, so many question marks as we get ready to figure out what the next school year is going to look like. And so you can start with this by a smaller package of hours and then add them as you need going throughout the year. So you can buy 5,000 hours up front and then buy another 5,000 at the change of next semester if you need to. Um, there's a lot of flexibility in that. So don't feel like when you run that calculator and you don't know what adoption is going to be like and you don't know what usage is going to be like yet that you need to buy the maximum number of hours. You can start smaller and then scale up as you see adoption and everything change. That's right. Um, one of the last questions here is, are all of the various PLTW courses uh, going to be accessible? They are. The, the, the one thing, Deborah, I would um, put here are there are some PLTW pathways that require access to physical stuff obviously your kids aren't going to have that remote, right? So if they're doing robot C and they're programming their, their, their robots, the robots are probably going to be at school. So uh, that's just something to think about. What we have seen is where the, the you know, the kids do the um, programming um, remotely and then they can save their files and then they can program the robots when they get in school. So we probably just need to have a little bit of conversation about what PLTW pathways uh, you're using today. Um, but yes, um, uh, very experienced with, uh, with all the uh, PLTW courses. Really great questions. Uh, thank you uh, for the participation and, and uh, obviously uh, Anna and, uh, and her team uh, can uh, follow up and we can uh, continue the conversation and more dialogue if there are more uh, specific applications. And, you know, for, for me, this has been a personal passion to, um, to enable uh, these students to, to work remotely, to be able to do their design work or their engineering work, um, uh, regardless of their location or whatever device that they have available to them. And I just want to reiterate again, it's super easy to get started with uh, a single package, um, learn your user uh, consumption, and then, and then go from there, right? 
So last poll that we have here on the screen to be interesting, I think for everyone to kind of get an understanding of, of where folks are, right? And so, you know, if you were to use this, this pilot project, what kind of funds uh, do you have available? And this is probably gonna be really dependent upon state and, and, and where you are, but uh, if everyone could take a, take a, a chance to just answer that uh, anonymously, uh, then we could, uh, we could at least share direction with kind of what, uh, what folks are thinking. Michelle, do we have uh, uh, answers coming back in? We do. We got about a little bit more than um, half of the votes in for this one. Okay. We'll leave it up for a few more seconds. And at the one question came in about uh, this session being recorded. Uh, can you, uh, will, will you be sending out a link to the folks who participated? Yeah, this session is absolutely being recorded and we will follow up with everyone with a recording of it. You can also uh, go to our website and we'll have things posted later on at bitespeed.com forward slash webinars. And it'll be up on there too, but I will email a link directly to everybody that registered today. Good question. All right, looks like We've got everybody that's going to vote, so I'm going to end the polling and then share the results. Drum roll, please. I was particularly curious on that question because it's one of the most common ones that I've been asked. What is everyone else doing? Um, how, are, how are they paying? Are they using general funds or CARE Act funds? So. Interesting, it looks about like what I've heard in conversations as well. Great. Well, I think that's it. Appreciate the uh, participation from everyone. If there's any more questions, don't hesitate to reach out and I'll be following up with everyone that's uh, submitted pilot applications. I hope everybody has a great rest of your day and thank you, Darren, and thank you, Joe. Um, you guys are awesome. Thanks so much. Appreciate Thanks, it. everyone, Thanks, for joining us. Thank you, Michelle. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.